a bad slow revolution. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, the period of the class we talked about uh, two key revolutions that changed the course of Western civilization. The American Revolution, which in turn uh, leads to the creation of the French Revolution. I found all the background of that, all the all the economic uh, background of that. So start off with talk about the Columbian Exchange, the Triangular Trades, Stamp Act, Stamp Act Congress, the British Prime Minister Frederick Lord North, the Revolution itself, the Declaration of Independence. Two figures from the American Revolution, just one of a hand, one of many, uh, one of many. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin. Battles of Lexington and Concord, the Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Yorktown, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, Mars different from the Treaty of Paris, 1763. It's kind of last semester's stuff. Huh? It sounds like last semester's class. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The Artists Confederation, Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Okay. It's the kind of thing about Western civilization, this whole course is America is such a important part of the development of the West, particularly from 18th, 19th century forwards, a lot of American history is going to overlap with Western civilization. Right. I'm trying to put it more in the context of what's happening around the world. Right. Any questions on these? A lot of them going through real fast. What's that? <laughs> now, uh, you have to understand the basic rule about war diplomacy is all wars are economic in nature. They all have an economic basis at some point. Maybe dressed up in certain ideas, but they're, certain, but they're basically economic. Who has what or who's trying to take what? Yeah. Um, basically what we're doing here is we're setting up what's going on in North America. Colonies are big business for the colonial powers. France, Spain, uh, the United Kingdom. We have other smaller powers trying to get in on the gravy, but not quite able to make the impact that uh, the big, those other big powers are. And basically, most of Europe is trying to uh, make a fortune off the colonies, trying to get colonies set up anywhere and everywhere, and they'll eventually try to corner colonize whatever corner of the earth they can. So it's a really big issue, especially if uh, areas like uh, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific in the 19th century. But at this point, the focus is the New World, basically North and South America. A lot of prime real estate, uh, untold wealth of resources, basically just sitting there for whoever's willing to take it, whoever's willing to take it from some people who are already there. I think the quote by John Adams is appropriate here. He once said, uh, John Adams, one of the co-authors of the Declaration of Independence, the second president of the United States, said, uh, I must study war and diplomacy so that my children may study math and science so that their children may study art and philosophy. <laughs> 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 we have a theme, we have theme music. Y'all been hitting The point is, hard decisions and hard work made by one generation, at least by the Western perspective, always designed to try to make life easier for the next. Our cars or those come after us may have it a little bit easier. You don't have to have the struggles that we have. Unless though life does throw struggles at us. How do we face those? How do we overcome those? But look at the world the way it's set up. The new world and the old world how it's set up. The European powers coming in, colonizing the new world rapidly, making an absolute fortune off of the uh, resources there, whether it be agricultural, trade, gold, silver, whatever else. Excess Spain is raking in billions upon billions of dollars off of the uh, billions upon billions of dollars off gold and silver mining. 
Now, of course, they're going to spend themselves in a bankruptcy by 1700, but uh, they're still making all this money off. And that's the key to any colony anywhere in any time period of history. The point of a colony is to make money. That's why you're spending all those resources, military, financial, corporate, uh, manpower, because you want to make money off it. And these colonies may uh, brought Europe to standard of living never before seen in history. They're making a killing off this. That's why they're fighting so fiercely off it, because every acre, every hill, every uh, crop, that is money. A ton of money, and they're going to fight a tooth and nail for every bit of it. So are like the peasant people, are they having a better standard of living when they're making all this money as well? A little bit. A little bit, like they're eating more? Sexually? Yeah, they're eating more. They're more food sources, more job opportunities. Next thing, for the English colonists especially, the English, lower class English, it's, hey, you know the drag society, England wants to get rid of them. So they send them over to the over to the colonies. They become farmers, uh, I say fishermen, uh, shippers, lumberjacks, whatever else. But basically, they're at England's hair. So did England have, have a relationship with the colonies at this point, or Oh yeah, the England up to up to the French and Indian War, they had a very close relationship with the colonies, but. Basically, they just kind of let the colonies kind of sit back and kind of run their own affairs. Because the colonies are growing very nicely. Like I said, the money's coming in uh, from uh, the colonies. Everything's working nicely for everybody. So, I'll give you a couple numbers here. Um, like I said, the Columbian Exchange, that's something that refers to the uh, exchange goods between the New World and the Old World. Trade between the hemispheres. And it's changing the world in all sorts of subtle ways because the Americas were cut off from the rest of the world for tens of thousands of years. So people even realized these were separate continents for the, or this was a separate part of the world. And so all of a sudden the Americas are here. They're on the world stage. Have all these resources that come along. But initially, mostly agricultural. Example: sweet potatoes, southern delicacy. But before long, they are staple crops in China. Like I said, core part of their diet: white potatoes, again native to the Americas. For a long, they're the staple main crop in Ireland. Foreign crops being introduced and in changing the way people eat and changing the way people live. Um, it's all sorts of other products. Tobacco, that's native to the Americas. Except, uh, some, or somehow somebody got the idea if you set this plant on fire and put it in your mouth, it's uh, somehow a pleasant experience. <laughs> so they start selling it by the ton in Europe, getting the direct European tradition of chain smoking. And change the way people live, the way people uh, uh, do business. And all sorts of other products, but also exchange back to, from the New World back to the old. Horses, not native to the Americas, but transform the way the Plains Indian tribes live. Uh, like I say, and so many other things. Exchange of products back and forth. But, uh, also, there is the biological exchange of diseases. Uh, like I said, smallpox wiped out the Native American population. Populations, some entire villages were wiped out by smallpox and caused by measles, flu, and other things. And Europeans had some immunity towards, but the Native Americans had none towards. Was it wiped out? <coughs> millions upon millions dead. Like I said, the germ theory of disease would come on to the late 1800s, so initially the Europeans were, didn't even know why this was happening. They knew there was some kind of connection between their presence and these appearance of smallpox, but they didn't quite understand it. But, but uh, there was an attempt during the French and Indian War. This uh, one British general ordered that these uh, blankets that would be used by smallpox patients in England be given to Native American tribes that were allied with the French 
try to make them infected with smallpox. Mm-hmm. Like I said, some of the blanks are just still just infected enough that it did work. Like I said, one of the bizarre instances of uh, biological warfare. But even without this incident, smallpox is an epidemic in these communities already. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, once the uh, Europeans arrived in the uh, New World, syphilis starts appearing in European port cities. And a sexually transmitted disease, it includes, among other things, it's incurable. Uh, I didn't have, didn't have a cure at the time, as one now, but uh, basically it's a progressive disease that eventually caused blindness, insanity, and death. But uh, it's because of this, now all of a sudden you have these new agricultural outlets in the new world, all these new products, uh, changing the food supply, changing the amount of the food supply. And I also have some of the excess population wandering off into the colonies. Actually, England, Scotland, and Ireland, this is all ruled by the British Crown. That's the immediate biggest beneficiary. A little bit of the French, a little bit of German. But all of a sudden, you have a growing population. Crops and harvests are good. You got this import of crops in from the New World, so more food supply, prices cheap, food prices coming down. People are able to eat a little bit better. So uh, you have a growing population in Europe. 1,700 population is 120 million in Europe. World population? Europe. Yeah, the uh, total world population is about 700 billion at this point, maybe. Don't hold me to that. By 1750, though, European population now is at 140 million. Slow, steady progress. We're having lots of kids. And those kids are surviving because better kept, better nutrition. Seventeen ninety, get up to one hundred and ninety million. That European population, total population here is about four hundred fifty four to eighty billion. So if that was the population now. I know it's like close to seven billion now, correct? Yeah. So, and I believe the world is older than. 6,000 years or whatever, yeah. but with that trend, it doesn't seem like it, the pop, human population has been around since about 2,000 years, right? No. Or just, I guess, guess disease killed off more people back then? Disease oh. killed off a lot of people. A lot of expectancy is very short. Uh, in the Middle Ages, a lot of expectancy uh, for growing, still only in the 30s, except mostly because very high infant mortality. Like I said, a lot of people get sick. Uh, a lot of people die of very, very easily curable diseases today. Uh, a lot of women dying in childbirth. Just very poor medical techniques, very poor sanitation. Killed a lot of people. Like I said, you have um, people much like ourselves. People in the prime of our lives, very good health, but uh, somebody pees in the water supply and everybody gets sick and dies. Yeah. It's, not, it's just that simple. Yeah. Massive cholera epidemic in the 1830s, uh, Indian cholera epidemic, we called it, just starting from India spread to Europe, killed more than one million people, basically caused by contaminated water. People drinking water with other with human waste in it was not treated. Next day, you, uh, next day, we live in an age where life expectancy has increased very dramatically. But also birth rates have fallen. People don't need to have many kids now for economic reasons. And now that family planning available, X8 plan how many kids you have. But uh, so the population is leveling off in the undeveloped world. Uh, poor countries, population is still rising very quickly. But uh, you have to take into account looking at population demographics, you have to look at uh, 
uh, life expectancy. You have to look at epidemics, war, uh, famine, extend the fluidity of the population, people moving back and forth because of epidemics and so forth, uh, moving back and forth because of famine and so forth. But, uh, yeah, the uh, world population in the 1500s only about 350 million. Um, about 350 million in uh, 1500. About uh, 10,000 BC is only made about 15, about 50 million. World population. World population. Of course, to figure out the population from historical estimates, you have to do a lot of digging. Uh, they didn't always have birth certificates and death records. They didn't, uh, you have to basically go to abandoned villages, go through. Uh, uh, burial sites and just look at uh, how people are living, look at whatever kind of reference information you find. Uh, it's an educated guess. But yeah, we have traces of human population going back, or at least human, known human, modern humans, going back 50,000 years, and our ancestors going back a couple million years before that. Oh, wow. I don't know why we're just now advancing, like, it seems, I don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about, it seems like we're just now advancing, like, by a lot. Yeah, human population, technology, so we live in a very remarkable age because mm -hmm. there's so much communications now, starting in the 20th century. Uh, people communicate easier, freedom of information, uh, better education systems. Like say, and uh, a lot of the foundations of the science we have today was built in the 1700s and 1800s. Kind of like an avalanche. The more we have, the quicker it goes. And then, so. People learning more from other people. Uh, I say, think of all the technology went into right here. Went into creating this phone. Synthetic materials to create the casing. Uh, camera technology for the little camera here. All the computer technology went into and um, to creating all the circuitry. <laughs> Satellite technology <coughs> to went into creating its actual ability to transmit and receive. And all that came together. A group of scientists and engineers coming together saying, okay, how are we going to make this work? We want to do this, this, and this. So they figured out, coming to plug in from all these places, then put it together a little bit more. Say, so, okay, now how are we going to improve on this? Do this, and this. And they want to hear from other people. Well, they're doing this and this. So let's do this plus this. And because you have the internet, because you have the worldwide ability to uh, send books, magazines, articles, uh, ideas, uh, to communicate with other scientists and engineers around the world, it goes faster and faster and faster. Some of human knowledge is at your fingertips. The internet. Yeah. So, more just pictures of cats. <laughs> <laughs> And so the course of technology is only going to get faster and faster and faster. I got an answer. What about social liberties? Like, was there ever a time in the world where there was more social liberties than there is now? And do you think that will continue? Quick, easy answer. It depends. Like I said, there were some countries that have been freer and sometimes than others. Let's say you go to say Iran in the 1960s, 1970s, it looked like a very Western country, very free to do whatever they wanted. That's a very reactionary revolution against them. Um, say because civil liberties are gained in one generation does not mean they cannot be lost in the next. Like say women had the right to vote in New Jersey in 1776 if they had property. But they lost that right in the early 1800s and regained it for 100 years. I say so. Well, social, the uh, arc of social liberties continue upward. Well, that's up to us. I say it has the opportunity to be a great tool to help it. People spreading information, spreading news, and information, and ideas. A lot of protests say this is wrong, but it depends on how you use it. Again, just writing on Facebook saying, <coughs> well, they can't do that. That's wrong. That's not going to do anything. And say, okay, let's meet at this time, organize this political party, or organize this petition, or 
meet at the Capitol to protest at this time? That's good. Uh, one of my friends got up a demonstration uh, a couple weeks ago in Little Rock. She, it was just going to be a few of our friends, and then like thousands and thousands of people showed up, and she like organized it all on my yeah, I don't think they can be done that way, but of course, look at the other way. Look at how many uh, racist groups are on the internet right now. Yeah. You think they're not organized? Think they're not plotting to undo everything's been done the last 50 years? How many stuff like that do you think is started by angry teenagers that people follow? It's like pissed off. It's not about the media. That's it. Some of it is uh, started by just angry teenagers, some uh, angry adults. Yeah. Like I say, but. Germany, uh, before war, uh, just after World War I in the 1920s, was one of the most liberal countries in the world, but the reactionaries, the far right, hijacked the company, took the country, and turned it into one of the most horrifying nightmares that human rights have ever seen. They seem to go back and forth very quickly. Yeah. Where civil liberties can, people who support civil liberties can organize, people against it do the same thing. And happy about that coming to power, we'll see. They convince enough people that they're doing you a favor by taking away those rights. Or marginalizing groups that you just don't like. <clears throat> but, uh, again, economics. I say these ideas, like <coughs> the advances in the phone, come about because of economics. People making money off it. People convincing they have a need for people convincing you can't live without that phone. Mm. Emily saying we can't live without these colonies. Just to finish our conversation, just in twenty years, to uh, when your kids look at this phone, they say, "How did you live with that? How primitive!" It's gonna be like the eight track. Yeah, it's to be the eight track cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> That's why <I> people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in drawer and take the other set of things. Some of the kids see them. I'm never like. Yeah. 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 Ye
drawn a little bit here and there, but basically these are the big three at this point. Labor intensive, but Europe is making a ton of money on this. A lot of money to be made. So you're getting these crops being shipped here back to Europe. And they need people to grow. They do. It's like can't use the Native American population because they're all gone by this point. Yeah. 1600. Actually, there was an attempt to use uh, the Spanish enslaved a lot of the Native Americans they first came over, but uh, they died very quickly because of uh, smallpox and other epidemics. Um, tetanus, measles, everything else. So there was one other quick uh, source of uh, large labor available, which was Africa. So, transporting slaves, mostly from Western Africa, to the New World for whatever products. And there's money made here. They're sent back to Africa to buy more slaves. You have this repeated pattern. One to the other. Okay, sugar. To Cuba, the uh, southern Louisiana, or the uh, uh, West Indies. You have those uh, large sugar cane plantations, places like Jamaica, the Cayman Islands. Uh, what happens is, make that sugar, not because Europe has so much of sweet tooth, but no, they take that sugar to... Uh, Northern rum distilleries. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, the ingredient rum. Yes, sir. Uh, shipped over to the cup. They, say wherever, they drink whatever they can. They sell the rest back to Europe, which goes to buy more. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Basically creating this triangular pattern. The slavery is the anchor of it. Not because disposable labor force to do the dirty work. I can say you're not going to work on a sugar cane plantation in Jamaica uh, 18 hours a day for no pay without uh, being forced to do it. And it wasn't just uh, Britain making a portion of this. It's, it's France. It's Spain. It's these other countries, other colonial powers. It's Holland. Everybody's getting a cut out of it. Next, even a lot of uh, Africans are getting a cut out of it. Basically, they're going deeper into uh, Africa to uh, retrieve, uh, capture enemy tribes to sell to the Europeans as slaves. Millions of slaves have come I'll show you what's happening here. Between 1716 and 1789, French exports quadruple. And that is basically because of the raw materials coming from the New World. So you can see just how important Trade between the New World and the Old World is just to France. British North America. Population goes from uh, 1.5 million in 1750 to just the United States by 1790, 3.5 million. So that's not including Canada and the Caribbean islands. Rapid growth of population, rapid growth of resources. Ben Franklin had said repeatedly in the 1750s that one day the uh, economic center of the British Empire would not be in London, but it would be in America. He was right. He was. America isn't uh, part of the British Empire anymore. Let's see why. And so in the 1700s, it's estimated that 9.3 million slaves are brought from Africa to the New World over the entire time period. 
two thirds just in the 1700s, or in the 16th and the 18th century. Let's throw out another statistic for you. By the early 18th century, more Africans had been brought to uh, North America than uh, Europeans. But the white population was still larger. All those slaves had died. Actually, this is creating change in Europe. So all this new money coming in, it's changing how people live. You have these people come very modest, mean, suddenly very wealthy. So, uh, 1794, uh, uh, French government particularly, is government permitting nobles to marry members of the middle classes. As these class barriers have been in place, are slowly breaking down. It was upward mobility because of this uh, uh, the shift in wealth, shift in the economy. You have such thing as a rising middle class. We weren't poor, we weren't wealthy, but enough to get by. But still, though, peasants still made up 85% of the population of Europe. Many of them, certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, living in serfdom. The amount of civil liberties you had depended on how much money you had. Most of them have very little of anything. You have due process of law in the English system, but and a little bit under the Dutch system, but not much more, not much else. Where did peasants take up 85%? All of Europe. All of Europe. Cities are growing rapidly. London, uh, by this point, 1790s, reaches a population of over a million people. The first city since ancient Rome to do that. The largest city in the world is London. Paris had a population of 600,000. There are 20 cities in Europe with populations over 100,000. Of course, they're growing rapidly. They have a lot of urban poverty, a lot of poor sanitation, so a lot of outbreaks of disease. Well, you've had these countries fighting over uh, everything here in North America. French and Indian Wars over in 1763. France essentially abandons its, call, its uh, claims in uh, North America on the mainland. So it's claims east of the Mississippi River going to England, claims west of the Mississippi River going to Spain. That's our consolation for us. The wars are very, very expensive. It takes a lot of money put men in uniform, train them, give them ammunition, give them food, shelter, transport them around the world. And you got to pay them, too. It's yes. a lot of money. Basic rural warfare is very expensive. you got to find a way to pay for it. So France and England, they paid for it through a combination of higher taxes and borrowing a lot of it. Of course, what do you do when you a country borrows money? You gotta pay it back. Supposed to. Uh, private individuals, <coughs> banks, corporations, just whoever they can find from. Did you tell them they were paying the funds or they weren't? They were. Yeah. It was a lot of cash. <laughs> so, of course, what happens if a country doesn't pay back what the money it owes somebody? <laughs> they shut the doors on you. We're not going to want yeah. anything to you it said in the old days, a country would send an army to collect, but yeah. uh, basically they sent accountants these days to basically see your treasury or basically your uh, currency just goes, value your currency goes to the toilet. Yeah. <coughs> so England's got to pay back that money. So it does. Basically, money it owes to everybody else, the entire economy will crash. There's the thing. England's won a huge victory in this war. They've won basically the eastern half of North America. Their problems in France, uh, uh, in North America are over, but they spent every dime they had to win that war. They're broke. They have to pay back this money. 
there's going to be a disaster for them. France, it's in the same position, but it doesn't have any, doesn't have the uh, resources of a co overseas colonies like it used to. France is going to face its own problems, basically stemming from the French and Indian War and stemming from the American Revolution. So here's what happens. Britain realizes it's got to pay back this money. So they get this Prime Minister, George Grenville, in office for two unpopular years. Pose among such other things as a cider tax, basically they're between cider, apple cider and apple juice. It's cider is a slight fermentation process to it, so that all tinge to it. But he put a tax on this cider, which was very unpopular. It briefly pushed him out of office. The king brings him back in. Among other things Greenville does is uh, he tightens collections of uh, taxes and import duties, as basically import fees that were due from uh, the colonies and elsewhere. Yeah. So uh, what he does is he sends the Navy to patrol the waters, patrol the shores of the Americas, try to catch anybody who may be getting out of port without paying their uh, taxes on imports or import fees. That's a lot of money for England they were losing. They realized there was a lot of smuggling going on. Americans trying to get around the system with a wink and a nod. Um, it might be easy to get weapons back then. It was. Uh, yeah. See, if you knew how to work the system back then, you could get away with it. Like say, you can forge papers. You can say you're going somewhere else. You can just sell them around. In fact, it was illegal for uh, the colonies to trade with the French during the French Indian War. So obviously, they're at war with them, but the colonies still imported a lot of French molasses for this northern rum distillery during the French Indian War. That made a lot of money off of that. It's yeah. probably fun to have some fun to war. Oh, yeah. Actually, what's. Actually, What's well, a little war thing like a war between friends? Mm -hmm. You've got money to be made here. There's business to be taken here. So Grenville sends the Navy after the, uh, after the colonists try to catch all these smugglers going in and out. But here's what happens. <coughs> Grenville creates something called the Vice Admiralty Court. Basically, it's a board of officers, of naval officers, senior most officers, Captains, vice admiral, rear admiral, senior admirals, all the way up here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. About as far from the world as possible, as far from usual shipping lanes as possible. And basically, you're being tri you'll be tried under military law for violations of civilian tax law. Basically, everything you would expect as an English citizen and all your rights in an English court strip away to a vice admiralty court. The court system, the military system, the civilian system are very different in every country because the military system, you have to remember, their purpose is to try to maintain order in the ranks. Somebody violating orders, they better have a very good reason for doing that. So essentially, you come in there basically guilty until proven innocent. Vice admiralty courts, you don't have an appeal like you do in the civilian system. You don't have a jury of your peers like you do in the English uh, system. It's basically, you're for that board officer, you better convince them what you did was right or what this guy's targeting with was wrong. They didn't win a lot of court cases. Say, English colonists tried to sue, take the case to British courts, saying that vice admiralty courts are a violation of, of law, but they get struck down every time. Also, you have these guys called the uh, Customs inspectors. <clears throat> Basically, they can run around with these little open ended search warrants, go anywhere they want, search anywhere, anytime, because they suspect someone's smuggling something to pay taxes. So England started to get its money back because they tied down on collections. What they had to do, though, was basically violate the English Constitution. By the English Constitution, I don't mean there's a written document, basically, body of legal precedence in the English system. The due process that the colonists have come to expect as English citizens. So they're really upset about this. These custom inspectors, they can order ships stopped, order all those guys to unload a ship. They search through everything. 
then reload it, and they can say, well, unload it again, because we feel like it. <laughs> so, when you get to the American Revolution, this is why the revolution starts on the coast first. Why it starts in cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia. Because they're facing the brunt of all these problems. They're having to face the bathroom, of course. They're having to face the customs inspectors. They don't like it. It's disrupting business, disrupting their right, disrupting how they've always done business. It's a violation of everything they've come to expect as English subjects. Customs is still kind of like that. Yeah, they they can be very annoying. I know. I had to deal with uh, like Navy customs, and like there's one little thing wrong on the I think manifest called I'm sure like one little item. All right, you need to take everything out of the context, get a you know serial number, whatever they want you to do. Yeah, they want to make sure everything gets through right, to make sure nothing illegal is coming in. Or uh, sometimes it's because Hey, they get paid ten dollars an hour. They uh, they decide they get the power to mess around with people. <clears throat> so this is going on. You have protests simmering back and forth, and Greenville steps in it again with passage of the Stamp Act. Basically, this is tax passed throughout the British Empire. You have to have this uh, stamp affixed to all printed materials, like say. Books, newspapers, almanacs, uh, diplomas, title deeds, everything, anything with something written on it, had this little stamp on it, put on it to say you paid your tax on it. Well, this is really upsetting the colonists because taxation always been a local matter for the colonists. You see, this is how the British see the uh, governmental system. George III, to Parliament, to the colonies. Colonists see it like this. The Parliament were equals, and Parliament simply just regulated uh, trade in between the different colonies. Everything outside the colonies, outside the colonial jurisdictions. The Parliament believed it's in charge of the colonies. They've got this essential conflict between the two. The colonists saying, you can't pass taxes on us because we don't have representation in Parliament. No taxation without representation. Big slogan, a big issue. Basically, of all the uh, people living in the colonies in 1765, not one colonist had a vote for any member of Parliament. There was not one representative in Parliament speaking for the colonies. I say like, taxation is a local matter. Parliament says no. We can tax anybody anytime we want. If you don't like it, we'll send the army over to collect. And they can say that because they've done it before. Like I say, you don't get to be a world power by being nice. Like I said, England's better than others. It's a freer country than others, but still, they play hardball when they have to. So they passed the Stamp Act. Colonists erupted in protest, particularly in the coast cities. Boston, Philadelphia, New York especially. They were getting other colonies behind them to saying, look, they are taxing uh, these, uh, uh, taxing on the ports, and they stamp uh, acts, but next time it'll be your farms. So they get nine of the 13 colonies together, it's something called the Stamp Act Congress, they to pass a series of resolutions demanding the Parliament repeal the Stamp Act, ask the King said uh, for a restraint of restraining Parliament and restraint of his government against them, and declaring that the colonists, that for the colonists, taxation is a local matter. Now, of course, after all these uh, months of protests and near riots in the colonies over the Stamp Act, Parliament passes the Declaratory Act, 1766. They repeal the Stamp Act, but the Declaratory Act, Parliament turns around and says, 
now the new prime minister that got rid of Grenville, said, we're appealing this as a courtesy to the colonies. We have authority to tax you whenever we feel like it. Now, there's some members of Parliament felt sympathy for the colonies, so, you know, they have a point, but they have the rest of the British Empire to worry about, not just Rhode Island and Connecticut and South Carolina. They have to worry about Irish rebels. They have to worry about uh, farms in Scotland. They have to worry about the colonies in India. They have to worry about Canadian fishing. They have to worry about uh, what they're going to do about the city of London that's growing so rapidly. Uh, that's where about problems of the urban poor in in England. We've got a lot of issues to deal with, not just the colonies. This is not just the colonies. So no one's really paying attention to. It. So the problem just kind of simmers for all. Congress passes this series of taxes uh, in 1767 called the Towns and uh, Revenue Acts. There's import fees, but the colonists basically just boycott all these products. So well, it's not going to buy them anymore. And so things kind of simmer along for a while. Then this guy comes prime minister, Frederick Lord North, prime minister for 12 years, 1770, 1882. And 1770 have something called the Boston Massacre. Clash between locals in Boston and the Redcoats, basically British soldiers are stationed in Boston, turns deadly. Like I said, the colonists didn't like the fact that troops were there because 1760 to 1770s, your army's only there for one of two reasons. To defend the country from a foreign invasion or suppress the population. Because you didn't have riot police at that time period. You sent in the army. You send in uh, armed troops against unarmed uh, rioters, rioters armed only with two by fours. You know what's going to happen. It's not going to be pretty. So, since this is Boston and New York and places like that where the French are gone, had been attacked by Native Americans in over a century, they have to be there because of option B. Suppress them. But Grenville stationed them there because. He's trying not to mobilize the army. He when all these guys unemployed. But still, he's not paying the average British enlisted. British aren't paying their average enlisted men enough to make to pay the bills, so they have to take a second job at night, which in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, the Charleston, South Carolina, cities like that, it's the only job you got, working the docks, loading the ships, which means you're competing with the locals. They have that added tension going in there. So this erupts into the Boston Massacre. Basically, this fight that in uh, between the two sides, with the Redcoats end up firing into the crowd, killing five colonists. Horrifying the world, especially the Lord North. Well, this eventually settles down. Lord North repeals all these taxes on uh, colonial imports, except for the tax on heat. It's from minor parliamentary authority. But of course, the colonists kept their boycott up against that because now they're not going to buy anything with this tax on it, plus the colonies, tea isn't a popular drink anyway. It's not something the colonists really got into. So, fast forward to 1773, the Tea Act. The British East India Company is about to go belly up. Huge import-export operation. And so what they do, uh, they need basically to be bailed out. Because if, if they don't, much of the Prime Minister's friends, much of the nobles, they're going to lose a ton of money because this company's losing everything. So they do is basically they give the... Uh, uh, Parliament gives the East Indian Company a monopoly on tea. Basically, get refunds a bunch of their money, and uh, says they can only pay like a have to pay like a quarter of the tax rate that everyone else has to pay. They can undersell anybody. 
So East India Company starts shipping all this tea to the Americas. Americans say, no, we're not buying this. I'm going to be bought off by cheap tea. Mm -hmm. The principle of the thing here. Yeah, monopoly on tea today. What if it's a monopoly on something more important to the colonies later? Say so had the Boston Tea Party. About 50 locals in Boston decide to dress up very thinly as, Mo as Mohawk Indians. So board the ship and dump 42 chests of tea at the Boston Harbor, giving it this nice minty taste for decades afterwards. <laughs> but the process, that cost about a million and a half pounds of tea. Pounds sterling. That's about, today's money is probably about $40 million. Basically, British said this is an act of vandalism. Some cities said this is an act of vandalism. So what is it going too far here? How about it's worth the money? Exit. Well, the insurance pay back the East India Company, but Parliament demands the city of Boston pay it back. Boston never did. Like had forty dollars or was that? Plus the estimate today's money, a million and a half pounds. Boston didn't have that; they're not going to pay for it because the city of Boston didn't authorize this. This wasn't employees. It wasn't employees of the city of Boston that did this. No. That's one of these things. So you have these crowds carrying on the shore, seeing this happening. But of course, afterward, no witnesses, no snitching, no, no witnesses. I didn't see a thing, but it was great. So England decides they're going to punish everybody. At the course of acts, they uh, 1774, they shut down the uh, ports. Um, basically place all of Massachusetts under martial law. Well, uh, Congress responds with the Continental Congress. Basically telling Parliament, say, look, you've got to stop this. It's going too far. We're a loyal English subject. We just want our rights as Englishmen. Parliament says, no. You're going to do it our way. The difference between England is, and the Americas is, England still based on a class system. They believed some people were better than others, particularly those who were better, that they believed the upper classes, if they were born into it, deserved to call the shots and tell everybody else what to do. Colonies, you had some of that there, but it's slowly moving towards a more egalitarian system. If people moved in positions of uh, importance and in the community because they earned their position. They don't have that period going back several centuries because they're there because they're born into Well, in order to clamp down further on the colonists, they try to seize the ammunition from local militias. Now, the British had given this ammunition to the men and men, the local militias, but they decided, no, we're going to take it back. So, April 19, 1775, they send troops out from Boston to uh, Concord to collect the ammunition. They have to go through Lexington first. Lexington, their minutemen are lined up as protest. Now, these are their own troops, their own people. British troops order them to fire on the minutemen. Fire on their own people. Just because they're standing there. Literally. March on to Concord. Other local militias gather, start shooting at the uh, British, force them to retreat. And this is what came to call the shot for the the world. <coughs> the opening battle of the American Revolution. Now, the next year, fighting is spread throughout the colonies. George Washington, a hero from the French and Indian War, has been appointed commander in chief of the armed forces of the United States. That's up on the condition he's not going to be paid for. It. By 1776, he said he's doing this for the honor of the thing, because it's on, because he's there to defend his country, not to, not for the paycheck. In 1776, Continental Congress is basically now acting as if more of a national government, saying it's time to declare independence. And so it appoints Thomas Jefferson to lead a committee, including jo uh, John Adams, Ben Franklin, and other men, to draft a, a statement of the world why they're pulling away from Britain. And Jefferson cites John Locke very heavily in his uh, right. Declaration of Independence. Basically, 
Governments are instituted among men, preserves earned inalienable rights, which are among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Protect life, liberty, and property of the Franklin decided pursuit of happiness sounds better. And list 30 reasons why they're breaking away from me. Violations of how they were shutting down uh, legislatures, unfairly imposing taxes, it came to the minor thing of citing uh, uh, Native Americans up against them, uh, declaring war on, their, on them, burning their ports, their cities. I said, no, we're pulling away. We're an independent country now. That is the Declaration of Independence. It's the ideological heart of the American Revolution. It has no legal power. Basically, it's a statement of the world. Why are we doing this? This is why. Because we don't want a government side that's going to declare war on us anytime it feels like one of the government that's going to protect us, protect our rights, and acknowledge our rights. But it's going to be a long, drawn-out, bitter fight because American colonists are undermanned, they don't have any weapons, and they're fighting the most powerful military force on Earth in the 1770s, that is the British Empire. Except while the cause may be just in the American eyes, the British see their cause is just as just, and they have a worldwide empire to draw from. Colonists just had themselves. So there are a couple of points which the Americans nearly lose the war. But they keep fighting, keep persisting. And plus they managed to find a little bit of help, mostly from France and other people who just don't like England very much. George Washington didn't exactly have a good track record of the He uh, yeah. wasn't too good at <laughs> military strategy. Well, well, Washington law did lose more battles than he won. But he uh, actually had, he had a lot of critics during the war, but basically he was the one of the job and he did it. But what's remarkable about Washington was he kept after the British every year of the war. Uh, he won the little victories where he had to. He challenged them and wore them down the big battles, but thought he won these couple little battles here and there to make an attorney tie. He just outlasted. Them. Sometimes in uh, fighting war, victory isn't always necessarily defeating decisively the side, it's just you win by.